Welcome to episode 55 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery. Recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, D.L., and this episode is Use of Force, Stop Killing Citizens, where I'll discuss the issue of police force and whether or not there is a problem. If you've watched this show for some time, you probably have an idea where I stand. So let's get into it. Hey, everyone. The issue of police force is, or use of force, is yet again in the news, and lively debates are happening as to whether or not the police are using excessive force and whether suspects effectively or outright deserve it. In this episode, I will mention a few stories from the news, but I'm not going to walk through them moment by moment. We'll save that for somebody else's podcast. I'd rather use this time that you've given me your attention to address some of the responses that I have observed and been given over the issue of police use of force. The first thing that people might ask is, what credentials do you have to criticize the police? It's a very common one. People often suggest that since I was never a police officer, I'm not in a position to criticize their job. But that's garbage because it's not something people even remotely are consistent with. It's almost always an argument used to silence critics of a given issue. Think of it like this. You've criticized social response to COVID-19. Somebody asks, are you an epidemiologist? Maybe you question how the poor use their limited resources. Somebody else might say, well, have you ever been poor? Maybe you suggest in this particular, like in this episode, that police use of force is unnecessary in many incidents. Somebody inevitably comes along and asks, are you a police officer or have you been? Watch carefully and you'll observe an interesting pattern. The same people who question your credentials to speak on a matter almost never ask for someone's credentials when that person supports their position. The same people who tell me that my lack of law enforcement experience precludes me from speaking against current things that I see never ask people who speak favorably to produce their credentials. Secondly, have you ever stopped to imagine how much quieter society would be if people only spoke in areas for which they had relevant experience, training, or education? The very people who criticize others for speaking out regularly speak out in areas they disagree with all the time, but yet are not necessarily experts or students of that particular topic. Many people speak out against, say, presidential candidates, but they've never run for office. Many people speak out against teachers, though they have never been a teacher. Even all the way down to the local mechanic. Again, many people who have never worked on a car. And thirdly, while I'm not really a fan of labeling things as American or un-American, I think there's a strong case to make that criticizing the world around us is the most American thing someone can do in this great country. After the conclusion of the Constitutional Convention in 1787, Benjamin Franklin was asked what they had given the people, and he responded, a republic, if you can keep it. We are all stewards of the government in this country. While it may be unwise for me to opine too much on, say, neurosurgery, this very nation was designed specifically for its citizens to maintain. And lastly, I want you to remember the words of Isaac Asimov in 1980 when he wrote, I believe that every human being with a physical, physically normal brain can learn a great deal and can be surprisingly intellectual. I believe that what we badly need is social approval of learning and social rewards for learning. We can all be members of the intellectual elite, end quote. The problem isn't a lack of experts. It's the very idea that only certain people should be listened to or should be permitted to speak about a topic. But about those credentials, 
while I have never been a police officer, I was part of a peacekeeping force in Bosnia with the United States Army. Despite being in a foreign country known to have about 9 million landmines all around the country, and despite going on multiple potentially dangerous missions, including searching a cave suspected of having a weapons cache, patrolling for sex traffickers with Interpol uh, along the Danube River, which resulted in one full-on chase through the city, and despite an almost gate breach where weapons were drawn, and despite going door-to-door asking people if they had weapons to turn in, and despite conducting hundreds of physical searches, not once did I or my fellow soldiers injure or kill anyone unnecessarily. uh, The same goes for all of the soldiers that I was with, not only just my immediate ones, but the other ones at other base camps. Yes, it was dangerous, but... I still had to conduct myself with a level of professionalism, unless I wanted to potentially find myself at Fort Leavenworth. Since we're on the topic of training, I get this video often in response. It shows an activist who experiences a series of three scenarios and comes out with a different perspective. Let's go ahead and take a moment to watch, and then I'll give you some thoughts. So I'm going to have you put, your hol- put the holster on right inside your, your belt loop there. Jarrett Maupin gets his weapon. You might recognize him as a high-profile organizer in the minority community. Just last month, he led marches on Phoenix Police Headquarters after an officer shot an unarmed man. We want his badge. We want his gun. We want his job. Today, he accepted an invitation to look at things from the other side, agreeing to go through a force-on-force training session with the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. Three scenarios where you have to decide to shoot or not shoot. Scenario one is a call about a man casing cars in a parking lot. Moppin approaches the man and starts asking questions. What? Uh, you have your hand in your you, you're looking for your vehicle. What kind of car do you drive? Where you have your hand in your gun. What kind of car do you drive? This is my car, man. Oh. Moppin, the officer, is shot. It happens that fast. At what time did you think that it was time for you to address the use of force that was given? Uh, when he came to the back of the vehicle, Okay. Uh, and and was hiding. You know, I could sense something something was wrong. Scenario two, a call of two men fighting. What's going on today, gentlemen? What's wrong with you? What's going on today, gentlemen? What do you want? What's happening here? What's wrong with Back you? Back up. Huh? Oh. What are you doing, man? Hey. Hey, he shouldn't we, approach we me. He shouldn't approach me. He we shouldn't approach me. He shouldn't approach me. In there. Yeah. What are you doing? You just shot him? Oh. Hey, he rushed me. Tell me why you shot. Well, I, I've shot because he was within that zone. You know, I felt there was a an imminent threat. I, I didn't necessarily see him armed, uh, but he he came clearly to do some harm to uh, to the officer, to my person. It's hard to make that call. It's a it shakes you up. Again, an unarmed man was shot. Scenario three: a call about a possible burglar walking down the street. Moppin gets him on the ground. He's not complying. I need you to keep your hands up, sir. For what? Because I need to check that waistband. Well, why? What are you doing? Because I don't know hey, what you have under there. Everybody, look at this guy. What are you doing? No shots fired. Huh? But the suspect did have a hidden knife in his waistband. I went through the scenarios, too, without seeing what Moppin did. So, uh, do you have keys, or uh, do you have anything you show me that? Yeah, don't worry about no, it. No, I need to talk to you. Come on, come on out over here. Well, I'm dead. Maricopa County Sheriffs, get on the ground. Get on the ground. Both of you, get on the ground. Get on the ground. For what? Get back. Get back. Same results for both of us. Things happen very fast out here. I asked Maupin what his biggest takeaway from this exercise will be. I didn't understand how important uh, compliance was, but but after going through this, yeah, my attitude has has changed. Uh, it, this is all unfolding in in 10 to 15 seconds. Um, people need to comply with the with the uh, orders of law enforcement officers for their own sake. Okay, now that we've seen this little clip, I just want to say right off the bat, the video is garbage. Unless we're going to suggest the activist received the same level of training as an officer would and therefore should be entrusted in actually responding to a real call, then the video doesn't say much. The training that he actually receives, I suspect, is much less than an officer. Like, much less. 
I deployed to Bosnia in 2002 as part of a peacekeeping force. We spent six months training for deployment and repeatedly conducted similar training, including mount training, what you might think of as SWAT-like training, you know, entering a house, clearing it. Small villages and base camps were set up for us to practice a wide array of scenarios. One of the many scenarios was a civilian who was playing the role of an old Bosnian woman who was coming up to our perimeter, perimeter with an explosive in her hand. The training was to react at the absolute last moment because in some scenarios she threw it at us and in others she was just an old woman wanting to get rid of a landmine that she found in her yard. And if that wasn't stressful enough, we had a civilian contractor criticizing us for how we entered a mock city, saying that we had entered too threateningly. Having always been vocal, I kindly informed the woman that we were the United States Army, driving around with armor plating, M16s, up-armored Humvees, and weapons bigger than me on the Humvee turret. When she asked how I would feel if I saw a military, a foreign military drive through my neighborhood, I politely told her that any military driving through my neighborhood would give me cause for great concern. The point here is that the rules of engagement gave us a significant disadvantage, but it also ensured we didn't shoot someone who was not a threat. The video and the man's experience certainly should give him perspective. After all, just because you can criticize another doesn't mean your criticism is necessarily of any value. If I were to hold people who say that to their own standards, their voice wouldn't matter much either, since most of them are also not officers with the relevant training and experience. In other words, if someone without relevant training and experience cannot say that certain levels of force are in excess, then someone without relevant training and experience cannot say that certain levels of force are appropriate. Maybe I've established sufficient credentials to, uh, credentials to criticize, maybe not. What I hope I've impressed upon you is that what really matters is the quality of the criticism. I want you now to next consider the biggest response that I get after that. And that is, if only they would have complied. Just days ago, the public learned about Adam Toledo, the 13-year-old boy who was shot by Pol uh, Chicago police. A lot of people are claiming the use of force was justified because the officer had no way of clearly knowing whether Adam was a threat. Here are the brief facts of the case as I understand them. Adam, who was 13 years old, was out at 2 or 3 in the morning associating with an adult, well, with some adult man. I'm not familiar with how old the adult man was, okay? But he was out at 2, two or 3 in the morning. Camera, camera footage exists of one or both of them firing shots from a distance. I'm not clear yet if they know exactly who was firing, which of the two, or... Uh, what they were firing at. The police were called and, uh, and they responded. Now, I want to stop right here. I want to point out that, yes, Adam was wrong to be out at 2 or 3 in the morning. And yes, Adam was wrong to be associating with an adult while they were out shooting a gun. It doesn't matter whether they were shooting a gun at an empty car or whether they were shooting at somebody. They were wrong in this particular case. So this is not in question here. So the police find both of the men, or both of the, uh, you know, Adam and the man, and they manage to arrest the adult man while Adam takes off down an alley. The officer chasing him yells for Adam to stop. After a few moments, Adam does stop. The officer sees a weapon, yells at Adam to drop it, and then to show his hand. Hands. Adam does. He does both. While the body cam footage doesn't clearly show that Adam has dropped the weapon, it does show that he turns with his hands up by his shoulders and then the officer fires. It is not unreasonable to expect an officer to recognize the moment a suspect starts complying and then not shoot. When we disregard that expectation, we effectively condemn suspects to death the moment they run or fail to comply and any demands to comply after that, they're meaningless. Think of it this way. If we rationalize that the officer just wasn't in a position to make that call, 
the officer might as well save his energy, shoot right away, and just tell the jury, I shot as he ran because if he had stopped and moved too quickly, I wouldn't be capable of determining whether he was giving up or not and would have to shoot him anyway. I do want to be clear. There are times when an officer is correct. I'm not condemning every shooting that I wish hadn't happened. And I'm not condemning an officer just because the kid was only 13. As one YouTuber pointed out, a gun in the hands of a 13-year-old is just as dangerous as a 30-year-old. Killing a victim, just the same. What I'm saying is that in this particular instance, when the officer shot at him, we have body cam footage of his hands in the air by his shoulders right before the shot. I'm saying that I expect officers to be well-trained so that, uh, similar to my training with the little old Bosnian woman actress and her intent of bringing us a landmine, I learn, and them, to be vigilant and make the call only if absolutely necessary. I expect citizens to behave unpredictably and incorrectly, even wildly wrong. Criminals often do many things to evade capture, but evading capture should not be a death sentence. Think about Dante Wright's case. Dante was pulled over because his vehicle tags had expired, and one of the officers had taken exception to a hanging air freshener on Dante's rearview mirror. Apparently, this is something that it's against the law, even though I was not aware of it myself. I think it goes by state. After running his name, officers discovered Dante had an outstanding warrant for failing to appear in court over charges of gun possession and failing to keep in touch with his probation officer. And that was over a charge against him for allegedly assaulting and attempting to rob a woman at gunpoint picture here is that Dante was very likely a bad character. It's hard to imagine someone who tries to flee as officers are attempting to arrest you because you failed to appear in court and keep in contact with your probation officer, which was all over charges that you violently tried to rob someone. But none of those reasons are why he was shot. Officer Potter a veteran of the police force since 1995 and a field training officer mistakenly grabbed her firearm instead of her taser. According to news reports, I don't own these two items myself, but according to the news reports, there is about a one pound difference between the two. That's pretty significant. You can find the video online where she yells taser multiple times fires, and then realizes she just shot him with an actual gun, then exclaims that she shot him. Okay, so it's clear that she didn't intend to shoot him with a gun. As Dante's critics say, it is true that if he had not resisted and tried to flee, he would not be dead. It's also true that had he not skipped out on his probation officer or missed his court date, he would not be dead. And it's also true that if he had not tried to violently rob a woman the morning after a party, he would not be dead. But again, none of those reasons are why he is dead. He isn't dead because the officers felt he was endangering their lives. He is dead because an officer negligently grabbed a firearm instead of her taser to subdue a fleeing suspect. As I said before, I would be more willing to accept an accidental shooting from officers if there weren't so many intentional shootings. The reason for that is both that they both seem to be very related to training and the laws we have on the books and what really seems like a high probability of not being charged, much less found guilty. Again, I cannot stress this enough. Dante wasn't killed because an officer intentionally grabbed their firearm and intentionally used it to stop an immediate threat. Citizens are not trained how to interact with the police, and many will make a foolish split-second decision to try and make a break for it, even though they shouldn't and are almost certain to not get away. 
it is a common occurrence, and police should be trained to handle these sorts of exceptions. I expect the police to be well-trained and to be able to respond to situations that are unpredictable, except for the fact that their occurrence is actually quite predictable, as odd as that may sound. Now, I want to stop here for a moment. I want to point out that we've had this conversation about guns in this country on a regular basis. And a lot of people like to point out that the Second Amendment talks about a well-trained militia. Okay, And so every time there's a gun shooting, uh, say like a, a mass shooting, they all clamor to the Second Amendment and say, well, you know, the Second Amendment actually limits because it's supposed to have it's supposed it's only calling for a well-trained militia. Now I tend to disagree with most of those arguments, but I wanted to point that out because we have a force. It's not necessarily a militia, but we have a force that is armed, and they are supposed to be well-trained. And you know what? I hear a lot of silence from the same people who tell citizens that they shouldn't have a firearm every time somebody uses that to kill not in defense and they're claiming that this is an issue of lack of uh, 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 the lack of a well-trained militia. Well, if you want to talk about well-trained and militia just to use a term in the sense of a um, of of a collective group of people, start with the police. But anyway, sometimes officers make mistakes when citizens aren't even aware that they need to comply. Take the case of Andrew Finch, a 28-year-old father of two. He was shot and killed by police for simply living at the wrong address and stepping outside at the wrong time. Here's what happened. Several gamers in different states were having a dispute over about $1.50. One threatened to have the other swatted, that is, make a call that would initiate a SWAT team response. The challenge was accepted, and the man making the threat was provided a fake address. He called the police uh, of the address in Wichita, Kansas. He told them he had just shot his father and was holding the family hostage. The police took action, surrounded the house. Andrew heard a noise outside, opened the door to take a look when an officer immediately shot and killed him. That's it. That's literally all of the major details to this story. No lack of compliance, no priors that invited officers to his house, just a guy whose address was given as a dare to call the police. But okay, maybe when they do comply, things work out for the best, right? Consider the story of Daniel Shaver. He was an exterminator on a business trip who invited a couple of friends to his hotel room. A call came in that somebody was pointing a rifle outside of the window, which naturally got the police involved. This rifle was part of his equipment because he would go to different businesses and he would shoot birds that had entered in. He was an exterminator. By the time the police got there, one of the friends had left and the other who hadn't left by that time was taken in unharmed. Police then instructed Shaver to cross his legs. Now, at this point, they're all out in the hallway. Right, So Daniel Shaver is down the hallway. He's on the floor. Police instruct him to cross his legs and get up on his hands and knees. He complied, but made the mistake of lowering his hand somewhere around his back. He was then ordered to get down on the ground and low crawl toward the officers. And he did, begging them not to shoot. At one point, an officer said Shaver reached down at his waistband, and at which point he shot him. I believe he shot him five times. What about that in between where a citizen is partially complying, but not fully? Just recently, 2nd Lieutenant, uh, I think it's Caron Nazario, was pulled over for a lack of license plates. Nazario continued driving until he reached a well-lit fuel station. This is something that I've heard recommended that many women who are driving alone do for additional safety. And many other people do it as well, not only for their own safety, but to assist an officer so that the officer feels more comfortable with a well-lit area. Even after seeing his temporary tags on the back of the window, the officer still aggressively approached Nazario and made multiple demands of him. Some of them were conflicting. He was told to put his hands outside of the window which he did, 
and then later told to unbuckle his uh, unbuckle himself, open his car door, and slowly step outside of the vehicle. He responded that he was afraid, to which one of the officers barked, You better be. Nazario wasn't shot, but he was eventually forcefully removed from the vehicle, pepper sprayed, and forcefully put to the ground. I want to stop here, and I want to tell my own story. It's very similar to Nazario's, with the exception I didn't have quite the aggressive response from officers. So I'm driving to work one morning. It's early, about 5 a.m. I get pulled over, and the officer puts every light he has into my car. Now, unlike Nazario, I pulled over right away. So where we were, it wasn't very well lit. Since it was 5 a.m., and because I didn't know any better, I flipped my rearview mirror up to reduce the light in my eyes so that I could see to grab whatever things I needed and just it was just blinding the crap out of me. Turns out, officers don't like that. He comes up to the car, stops about midway of the driver's side passenger door. Very firm voice, he demands that I exit the car slowly. I do. He starts berating me over flipping my rear view mirror up. And then, and I kid you not, he says, when you flip your rear view mirror, you know what that tells me? That you don't want to be blinded. Now, I want you to imagine a 20-something who is a bit of a smartass trying to hold his composure. I wanted badly to say, no crap, Sherlock. Then he asked me if I knew why he pulled me over. I told him I did not as I was wearing my seatbelt, driving the speed limit, and otherwise following traffic laws. At the time, I did not yet know to keep my mouth shut. He walks me back about 10 feet behind my car, and he asks me what I see. I'm still clueless. He then says that my smoke-covered license plate cover makes it hard to read my license plate. And then he gives me a warning, but tells me, again, in a very strong, firm, aggressive voice, that it better be removed by the next time that he sees me. Now, remember, I'm early 20s. I bought the cover at Walmart because I thought it would make my car look eh, just a little bit nicer. I was under the foolish impression that if Walmart sold it, that it was legal for me to use. I didn't get shot and I didn't get tasered. So I'm quite lucky, very fortunate. But it was a very negative experience for the crime of having legally purchased an accessory for my car while not knowing any better. Despite the lack of force and the aggressive posture, the, uh, the lack of force, the aggressive posturing was unnecessary. One might even argue that with a store like Walmart selling such accessories, officers should know and they should just simply pull someone over and say, hey man, I know you spent like 20 bucks on that license plate cover, but I got to tell you, it's illegal and I'm going to have to ask you to remove it. But you know what? Have a good day, man. Stay out of trouble. That's it. Such aggressive posturing opens the door wide to misconduct elsewhere. And the reason is because that level of aggression is considered acceptable for such a minor offense, it's easy to graduate to a more dangerous aggression. Consider the case of Kelly Thomas, a schizophrenic homeless man in Fullerton, California, back in 2011. Kelly was beaten so badly by police that they broke his facial bones, left him in a pool of his own blood, and then demanded that the emergency personnel tend to police first, who suffered no serious injuries. Kelly went into a coma while in the hospital, and life support was pulled five days later. Video later surfaced with, uh, which the, uh, with the following conversation between the officer and Kelly. And before I give you this conversation. I just want to again point out uh, the show is generally family friendly. So if you have children, this may be a point that you may want to cover their ears. But here's what they said. Now you see my fist? Officer Manuel Ramos asked Thomas while slipping on a pair of latex gloves. Yeah, what about them? Thomas responded. They're getting ready to fuck you up, said Ramos. To which Thomas replied, start punching, dude. That's it. Well, that's the part that I wanted to repeat. Ask yourself, is that the sort of policing that we want in America? 
In a prior episode, I talked about America is supposed to be the best, and we should challenge everything. We should ask a simple question. Is that the best we can do? Is that the best policing we can do right there? Or any of these stories that I've uh, repeated to you, are they the best that we can expect? Because it seems to be coming more prevalent. It's 2021, and we've been having riots over policing since as early as 1965, when the Watts riots broke out. There is story after story of incidents where officers use unnecessary aggression in their interaction with citizens. In some cases, the citizens were wrong, maybe even exacerbating the situation. Some of them were indeed criminals. Some themselves were frightened. Some complied. Some never had the chance. One more personal story. Back in 2017, our local police department held something called Coffee with a Cop. It was a good conversation, but I was disappointed on one, uh, on one particular element. In response to stories like these, they expressed their wish that people would remember most interactions with police do not end so tragically or violently, but end much more peacefully and without conflict. I asked if they were willing to reciprocate and not themselves be tense and aggressive during encounters such as mine, knowing, as they said, that most citizens would cause them no harm. Their response was underwhelming, saying that they just never knew what they were going to be walking into and therefore must approach the situation with a heightened readiness. In other words, it's not fair for citizens to fear them, but it's completely fair for them to, to fear citizens. To that, I say, then lead by example. It's time to stop accepting subpar police work and demand better. I'm going to skip the bill review today. Instead, I'd like to offer a different closing. In August of 2019, a man named Elijah McLean, a 23-year-old black massage therapist, was walking home when he was confronted by the police. Having watched the body cam footage and re reading various sources, it seems he was a bit of a young, awkward man in the wrong place at the wrong time. The body cam footage recorded his last words. To honor his death, and the deaths of any American that, uh, that has occurred at the hands of police, but didn't need to, I would like to speak his last words. It will be dramatized and on purpose. I want you to consider the words that he actually spoke. These are, the wor these are his actual words from the body cam. And I want you to imagine if these words were your son or daughter's last words. <laughs> I can't breathe. I have my ID right here. My name is Elijah McLean. That's my house. I was, I was just going home. I'm an introvert. I'm just different. That's all. I'm so sorry. I have no gun. I don't do that stuff. I don't do any fighting. Why are you attacking me? I don't even kill flies. I don't eat meat. But I, I don't judge people. I don't judge people who do eat meat. Forgive me. All I was trying to do was become better. I will do it. I will do anything. Sacrifice my identity. I'll do it. You are all phenomenal. You are beautiful and I love you try to forgive me. I'm a mood Gemini. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Ow, that really hurt. You are all very strong. Teamwork makes the dream work. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to do that. I just can't breathe correctly. <laughs>